Hi, the espresso bin is being marketed as a different type of SBC. How different is it, and is that difference what you want? Find out in this video. Hey, uh, what's Dad doing? Oh, well, he's trying to hitchhike on a Vulcan construction ship. Come on! Isn't it a Vogel constructor ship? Yes, I know it is. I told him that, but at least it's keeping him. Hey, Dad. Live long and prosper. What? The website says Espresso Bin is a single board computing platform unlike any other. This is a true statement. However, like any SBC, there are pros and cons. It's up to the maker to decide whether they can use it or not. Espresso Bin sent me two units, one for a competition I ran and this one. There are two models in the lineup, with a 1 gig and 2 gig version. Since it is a platform unlike any other, it isn't a board for everyone. Taking a look at what it gives you, starting from the top right, working clockwise. USB 2.0 host, the first of two GPIO headers, reset button, boot and reflashing jumpers allowing you to boot from SPI flash, EMMC or SATA, SATA connector, SATA power, USB for console, JTAG header, 12 volt DC jack, the second GPIO header, USB 3.0, 3 gigabit ethernet ports, and a mini PCIe slot. The first thing you'll notice is the lack of any video out. It is possible to add a graphics card via mini PCIe, but driver support would be limited, and it's not really designed for it. There are better options if you want graphics. On the flip side we have an SD slot, an Amada 3720LP, 1 gig of the installed 2 gig DDR3 RAM, eMMC, which isn't currently installed on mine, Topaz 6 port gigabit ethernet switch, which incidentally is powered by a Z80 CPU core, 4 channel logic level converter, SPI flash, and a bunch of ESD protection chips. Moving back to the front and removing the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth PCIe card, we have one of many voltage regulators, two more of the little buggers, which are part of two buck converters providing 3.3 and 1.8 volts to the board, USB ESD protection, even more ESD protection, another buck converter chip, yet more buck converter chips, and lastly an I2C logic level converter. So there's several important design decisions I've made here. Espresso Bin took the decision to use a lot of step down regulators instead of using a PMIC. This could be due to cost savings or component sourcing. It's not an issue either way except that overclocking is now off the table. There is plenty of ESD protection on the board which is required when entering the European market. Overall it's a well designed board, however there is a but. There are plenty of GPIOs provided, more so than any other SPC. Unfortunately the Amada SOC is a 1.8 volt CPU and is not tolerant of 3.3 or 5 volts. In cases like this the normal practice is to use logic level converters, however this introduces delays in signals causing havoc with SPI and I2C. Even though they have provided 5, 3.3 and 1.8 volt header pins, Espresso Bin don't have any logic level converters on the GPIOs. So out of the box you will not be able to use any of them. Espresso Bin have provided a quick start tutorial along with a pre-formatted SD card. This is a good idea, because loading up an OS currently isn't as straightforward as burning an image to the SD card, and will throw off a lot of novice users. All you need is Ethernet, USB console and power. However, there's a bit of an issue here. Notice this LED lights up when I apply power. Doing the same without DC power lights up the same LED, which means the USB bus is powering the board in some way. Looking at the schematics, it seems that either the 12 volt rail is being back powered, or the schematics are wrong for the LED indicator. Since the USB 5V rail is powering all the other voltage rails, then LED2 or LED1 would light up when the USB cable is connected. Either way, the CPU won't have enough power to run the board. 
and will only beat up properly when the DC power jack is connected. The LED will glow brighter as well, indicating a high current flowing through it. Testing this theory out, with the DC jack in, I was correctly seeing 12 volts and 5 volts in the right spot. However, removing the DC jack saw the 12 volt line drop to a little under 5 volts. This means that the 12 volt line is being back powered in some way, and is the reason for the LED being dimmer. Essentially, it will not boot until you have 12 volts in. Logging in was fairly simple. The board will appear as a serial USB device, and you're presented with an install of Ubuntu 16.04. You'll see a bunch of network devices already configured up, along with the dual-core Cortex-A53 Amata CPU. Since this board has a bucket load of GPIOs, let's see what is avail- oh, okay. I started seeing kernel crashes constantly, happening a couple of minutes into boot. Turns out it was a script attempting to change the CPU governor from the default performance to on-demand. Clearly, there's something wrong with the kernel module here. So I simply disabled this from running using systemd, as I wanted performance mode anyway. So finally time for some GPIO tests. Turns out there's no SPI available, but there's I2C and a bucket load of GPIOs. Remember that these outputs are 1.8 volt logic levels, so driving an LED will result in a dim output. You can connect the LED to the 5 volt or 3.3 volt line and then toggle the GPIO low, but when the GPIO is high, there will still be a 3.2 or 1.5 volt drop across it. Not particularly good. Testing other GPIOs is something for a review update, as my stock of logic level converters were being used elsewhere. So moving on to the network tests. I was surprised that I was seeing only 509 megabits per second on TCP throughput. It is slow and should have been faster. However, UDP tests showed up a fairly low jitter. So the low TCP throughput was possibly due to the fact that software bridging was enabled. This is something else I need to look into for the review update. Next on to some Pharonix tests. For this I used a simple copper heatsink. There was no thermal info built into this particular kernel, and as mentioned before the CPU was set to 1 GHz. I also attached a 2.5 inch 250 GB SATA disk. It's not the world's fastest, but good enough for these tests. And rigged up a very permanent cooling arrangement. <coughs> There wasn't enough space to use my usual Uber heatsink. This time round, I ran the Phronix test for around two weeks. There was the occasional crash here and there, but overall it chugged away running its tests. I kept tabs on the temperature regularly using a cheap infrared sensor. I saw an average of around 30 degrees Celsius and a peak of almost 36 degrees Celsius. This was with a fairly constant ambient temperature of 20 degrees Celsius even taking into account for the emissivity of copper, which would add at least 5 degrees, is still running quite cool. As for power, I didn't have my USB power logger with me, and so resorted to taking timed photos. Current draw often hit 1 amp, with a peak of 1.7 amps, and the average was around 830 milliamps. Note that this was at 12 volts. And what was the end result of all these benchmark tests? On the network side, local loopback was a little on the high side. And there was a mixed bag of results for SATA performance. For example, SQLite, Apache and Kernel Compiles all lagged behind other boards, but was around the middle mark within boards of the same price for the D-Bench, Postmark, AIO Stress and Redis benchmarks. When it came to CPU processing power, Cashbench and Clomp found the Espresso bin lagging behind most of the other boards. However, RAM speed highlighted the fact that the Espresso bin was around the same as the Pi64. When it came to maths benchmarks, the Bork benchmark, which tests encryption capabilities, surprisingly was extremely slow. So much so that I'm discounting this benchmark as there was too much variance between subsequent tests. However, compression benchmarks show the board either lagging behind or sitting in the middle of the bunch. The same happened with audio encoding, fast Fourier transforms and encryption benchmarks. Running general CPU benchmarks such as Dolphin, Four Stones, Timed Hammer, Minion and Stockfish all saw the Espresso bin lagging behind everything else, but the small PT benchmark placed it once again in the middle of the pack. 
The same could be said with the interpreted language benchmarks. Next I thought I'd try out the beta release of Ambien. It didn't quite boot up, but it was a beta after all. It seemed to be missing the device tree table file. This involved simply adding a symlink to the correct DTB file. It was there, just that the kernel expected it to be in a different place. It then booted up without issue. Alas, there were no GPIOs, I2C or SPI built into the kernel. This is something else I'll need to look at in my review update. So what do I think of the Espresso bin? Overall, it's a well-designed board with a fair amount of ESD protection, but the USB console powering issue needs to be looked at. The 1.8 volt GPIOs will be a real pain for most users, and places this board into the Pro Maker market. It would make an excellent router, but the low TCP throughput might be an issue for some, and it would be interesting to see if this improves with newer kernel releases. The temperature stayed well within lower limits, and it performed reasonably well across all the benchmarks. Comparing it to other boards on CPU power alone, it sits amongst other boards such as NanoPi, Pine64, Orange Pi, and the original High Key. The file system performance is fairly decent, but again, the slow network might be an issue for some. The company is doing well building up a community around it, and have put up several tutorials, but they will need to expand their documentation a bit more. There's still a number of tests I need to look at, and I'll publish a review update once development has progressed a bit more. Anyway, thanks for watching, and see you next week.